and I will earn it. But I want you to know the reason that I'm running for President of the United States of America is because I believe it is totally unacceptable that we are about to hand over the greatest nation that ever was, the United States of America, to the next generation, some of whom are in this room, less good, more divided, less competitive, less productive than earlier generations got. And I say this isn't who we are. We're blue sky problem solving can do optimists as Americans. And today we find ourselves in a hole. And I say we're gonna get out of this hole. We're gonna get out of this hole, folks. But in order to get out, we need a leader who's gonna focus on the two most important issues of our time. One is an economic deficit. We need to launch an industrial renaissance. Create jobs, expand this market's economic. We are the largest market in the world, we forget that. 25% of the world's GDP with the most productive worker. We've just forgotten how to do it. And we're gonna get back in the game and we're gonna create some jobs for the next generation. And we're gonna make sure that the debt that now is about to be passed to the next generation is changed. We're not gonna hand down $15 trillion in debt. We're not gonna hand down the nation that has 80, 90% debt to GDP. That's just not gonna work. The next generation deserves better. But I'm also here to tell you we've got another, another deficit that we as people must take care of. And find a leader who can lead out in getting it done. And that's called a trust deficit. Because we no longer trust our institutions of power as people. And we no longer trust our elected officials. I say, how did we get to this point? How pathetic is this? The greatest nation that ever was founded on trust. And now we're running on empty. So I say we're going to do a few simple things. I'm going to be the president who's going to lead the charge toward term limits for Congress, folks. Yeah. And while we're at it, we're also, going to, we're also going to close that revolving door that allows members of Congress to file right on out to become lobbyists trading in on yeah. the other side of the right. 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 And while we're at it, why not just say we're going to dock their pay until they can balance the budget? <laughs> And I say Congress, no trust. But you know what? There's no trust in the executive branch either. Because at a time when this nation needs leadership most, it's nowhere to be found. The Simpson-Bowles Bipartisan Commission report on debt and spending and tax reform falls right on the president's desk. And it goes in the garbage can. No trust. And I say there's no trust in our tax code. <coughs> Riddled with loopholes and deductions for anybody who can afford a lawyer or a lobbyist on Capitol Hill. One trillion, one hundred billion dollars in nonsense. This president's going to phase it out. This president's going to clean out all of the cobwebs and we're going to lower the rate, broaden the base, and simplify and get this country back in the game. And I look at our wars abroad and I say there's no trust there either. We've been at the war on terror for 10 years. And I just want to square with the American people and say we've got a lot to show for it. We've run the Taliban from power. We've upended Al-Qaeda. We've had free elections. Osama bin Laden is no longer around. I want to bring our troops home. We have done what we can do right. in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. begin preparing for the future, I want to square with the American people and say Afghanistan is not our future, ladies and gentlemen. Iraq is not our future, I hate to inform you. Our, fu our future as people is how well prepared we are to rise up and to meet the competitive challenges of the 21st century. And that's about economics, and that's about education. And that's going to play out largely across the Pacific Ocean in countries I have lived in before. And I'm here to tell you without a hint of hyperbole at all that unless we get our act together and fix our core right here at home, we will see the end of the American century by 2050. And that's not the legacy we are going to leave behind to the next generation, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! Let me just finally say we also need a president who's going to take on the big banks. What's this about banks that are too big to fail? Give me a break. Or we can fix our economy and get moving in a pro-growth direction. We have this Damocles hanging over our heads called banks that are too big to fail. We are setting ourselves up for another bailout. 
That's not fair to the taxpayers. And I say, we have been there, we have done that on the bailout side, and we're not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. But right. in order to ensure that, we got to right-size the banks. We have to take banks that today are too big to fail. We have to right-size them. Because if you're too big to fail, you're too big. Capitalism without failure isn't capitalism. What book are they playing from? I say we need a president who is not in the hip pocket of Wall Street. We need a president who isn't carrying the support of half the members of Congress in order to bring reform to Capitol Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, we can get it done. I need your help. I need your assistance. We need to get this word out to neighborhoods across this state. And then we're going to turn out on Tuesday, and an interesting thing is going to happen. All the conventional wisdom that all of the pundits want to fill our heads with. They come into town, they want to tell you what the order of the universe is. And then the people of New Hampshire rise up on primary day, and they always upend conventional wisdom. I think it's about to happen again. And when it happens, folks, you will have been part of making history. And we're going to head out of New Hampshire with a head of steam. And we're going to keep this ball rolling in the name of the next generation because they deserve better, the American people deserve better, and at the end of the day, this is about bringing us together, first and foremost as Americans. We don't need any more division. This is about serving our country. I had another presidential candidate last night who called into question my service for a Democrat. I say, where have we come as people? <laughs> what about putting your country first for heaven's sake? He's got signs around the state saying, believe in America? If you want to believe in America, you've got to be able to serve America, for heaven's sake. And service isn't limited only to one political party. We've all got to pull together and make this country a better place. a couple of questions for me here. Thank you. Anything, comments, questions, <laughs> criticism, we take it all. Hi, Dennis Filger from Bedford, New Hampshire. Dennis, yeah, good to see you. Nice to see you here. The question is about immigration and securing our southern border. I've, I've read all your other positions on the issues, but I wasn't clear on where, where you stand around stopping immigration and what we do about the illegals that are here now. We've already stopped immigration. We have so screwed up our economy, nobody's coming over the border. <laughs> I say that tongue-in-cheek, but if you look at the numbers, we are at a low in four decades. Nobody's coming. There are no jobs. We never thought we'd solve it by screwing up our economy, but that's exactly the effect it's had. And I say, how unfortunate. But here's, here's, here's what we must do as people. I think we owe it to the American people to secure our border. I don't think this discussion has a whole lot of intellectual honesty until the President of the United States can work with the four border governors in confirming that the work has actually been done. I've been down to the border with uh, my National Guard troops uh, installing technology. Uh, we have fenced probably uh, one-third of it. If you want to keep uh, putting up fencing, it's going to cost. You can put in technology. Here you can have boots on the ground. But I think securing the border is important, and we've got to take care of people who are here. Some say put them on buses and send them out. I say, I don't know what planet they're coming from. I don't know who pays for that. I don't know how you handle it logistically. We have a problem in this country, and I'm a realist, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to use political rhetoric and just say send them home, put them on buses. How do you do that? I say you can take out the criminal class. They can go home, and they've all broken the law to some extent, but we have a criminal class that can go home. We've got to sit around as Americans. We've got to sit around and figure out a solution going forward. We can find a solution. I have every belief in, in that ability. And then we're going to have to look at the movement of people. Because in the meantime, our visa system is screwed up. And that is to say, the students that want to come in that later add to our nation's brain power, the travelers and the tourists who come into this country, we've gone from 17% market share in, uh, with respect to inbound travel and tourism to about 10% market share. We're losing money, we're losing jobs, we're losing opportunity because people can't find visas to come in and visit. Somebody else is picking up that business. I say, I'm not going to let that happen as president. I'm going to get together with a new secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and we're going to fix that department. We're going to fix these problems. Thank you. Back here. Yes, ma'am. Back here. Um, I want to know what you plan to do about the health care 
for veterans returning from war and continued health care for them. Uh, I think that we're in for a big, um, with mental health issues, uh, trauma, and handicap issues. How do you plan on taking care of them and continue uh, to keep them healthy? With it's just me tapping your hands, don't worry. And do you think that their families deserve a bigger salary? Let me just say that uh, how we treat our veterans, I think, is a, uh, is a representation of our nation's heart and soul. I have two boys who are just beginning their journey in the United States Navy, and I kind of look at the years ahead for them. It, it informs my thinking on foreign policy, on the deployment of troops, on veterans, and everything else. I'm going to do what I did as governor. As governor, I took care of our veterans in our state by creating the first ever Department of Veterans Affairs. When people said we couldn't get enough resources together to build a nursing home in part of our state for veterans, we did what people said we couldn't do. We all pulled together and got it done. Because I believe that uh, the men and women who stand between our nation's liberty and freedom and the enemy are pretty remarkable people. And do we owe them a lot? We owe them a lot. Absolutely. <laughs> tell you this as well. As president, I'm not going to let the men and women come from uh, the theaters of combat, the front lines, to the unemployment lines. That's not going to happen either. They're going to help to rebuild this country. They're going to come back to jobs. And they're going to do what the greatest generation did during their time, which was to rebuild this nation when we needed it. And I can feel this next greatest generation, and that's what they are, are going to be part of rebuilding this country now when we need it most. <laughs> yes, right back here. Hi, uh, Governor Hudson, welcome to Cap Thank you. <laughs> this morning in the debate, um, David Gregory asked you a question about how you begin to deal with the debt that we have, and um, you uh, mentioned mean te means testing um, for Social Security and Medicare, and you also talked about um, making cuts to the Department of Defense. Um, and, you know, I, I, I agree with those things. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you truly believe that we can sustain the entitlement programs that most of us really want um, without letting the Bush uh, era tax cuts expire. Well, under my tax plan, that would take care of the Bush tax cuts because I'm going to phase out all loopholes and deductions, all of them. And uh, we're going to pay for it uh, by the money we raise when we phase out those loopholes and deductions. We're going to invest it back in the tax code like I did as governor. So I'm not giving an academic dissertation. I'm just I'm speaking as a practitioner. We're going to lower the rate, broaden the base, and simplify, uh, which is completely doable, and it leaves us with a much better and a more competitive tax code. But I would say on entitlements, we just have to recognize the world we live in today. The world will change. We have no choice. I'm not giving a political speech on it. We have no choice. We're going to have to recognize that on Social Security, we're going to have to change some, some things. We're going to have to change probably retirement or eligibility age. We're going to have to look at the underlying assumptions for inflation and probably tie it more to real wage growth as opposed to the CPI. And yes, we're going to have to means test. But I think there are a whole lot of people at the upper income categories in this country who don't need those services and would be the first to stand up and say they don't need those services. So as president, I'm not going to hesitate to call out for a shared sacrifice. I'm not going to play class warfare, but I am going to call on this nation to uh, embrace a shared sacrifice. Thank you all very much for having me here. I'm honored and delighted.